Amen. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to church. You can have a seat. Man, great job today. Did they do a great job? Yeah, yeah they did. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, if you got your Bibles, we're going to be in the New Testament. We're going to be in 1 Timothy. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis. And so we're going to be everywhere because we're in this series. If you're, if you're new, uh, it's entitled How Not to Read the Bible. And you're like, aren't we supposed to learn how to read the Bible? Well, yes, we are. But sometimes in order to read it correctly, we've got to realize how not to read it, right? And so... We're looking at some otherwise kind of odd passages and things throughout Scripture, but here is the purpose. Here's the purpose, is to leave after these six weeks with an increased confidence about approaching God's Word. And so I know a lot of you are in these How Not to Read Your Bible groups that are meeting on campus Tuesday and Wednesday, and a lot more that are meeting off campus. I just want to know, like three weeks into it, who's feeling like a greater sense of confidence as you open God's Word? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that great that, that you can open, yeah, that you can open God's word and you realize that there is a context uh, historically, culturally, theologically, and as we dive into that and better understand it, man, we can just mine these incredible truths that God has for us right now, applying them to our lives, that we can follow Jesus in the way that he would intend for us to follow him, and so I'm looking forward to us continuing to, to move forward in this six weeks, and so you know what? Uh, I'm bummed out for those of you who weren't, or maybe you had uh, some sort of conflict that prohibited you from getting into a group, but don't worry, because we don't want to see just the groups come together for how not to read the Bible, because our next series we're getting into is, so now what, which is we're looking at Acts and what the church did and how it moved forward, and And if we're reading and learning how to read the Bible together, let's stay in those groups. And some of you who are like, I didn't get into a group. Well, it's the perfect time for you to get into a group because we're going to be in the book of Acts and you'll be learning about the history of the church and what God was doing then and what he wants to do now. And so it's not too late to be thinking about that then. So uh, I grew up, you know, kind of all over the southeast United States because my dad worked for IBM and so spent some time like Indiana and Dallas, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, and Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. But Charlotte, North Carolina was more or less home. I mean, I was in elementary school there from second to fourth grade, and then we moved away and then came back like the summer of eighth grade. And so then from like late middle school through high school, that was home. That's where our family is. That's where so many of our networks and connections are. And, and I have fond memories of the school that I graduated from because it's also the one that I went to elementary school in second through fourth grade. And I'm amazed by people who can like rattle off all the names of their elementary school teachers. And it's like amazing. You're like, oh, you know, Miss Becky in seventh grade and then so-and-so in third grade. And I remember like a couple of my teachers because they had a significant impact. And one in particular was my second grade teacher at Charlotte Christian School in Charlotte, North Carolina, which if that sounds familiar, Uh, you know, a living legend in the NBA, also graduated there much longer after I did. Steph Curry is a graduate of Charlotte Christian. Eh, So we got that flex on you. (laughs) You're welcome. Gave you Christian McCaffrey. Going to give you Steph Curry. Anybody else you ask, we'll get them for you. So um, second grade, I had Miss Richardson as my teacher. And I just remember her because she was like super engaging and I could get away with murder in her class. Uh, metaphorically speaking, because her son, uh, Sean, was in the class as well. We were friends, and so we could just basically do whatever we wanted, and so we kind of got disciplined. But I don't know about you, but in second grade, like, the things I looked forward to weren't necessarily English. (laughs) It wasn't necessarily math. I had two things in second grade that I really looked forward to. Lunch and recess. That's what I look forward to. That's where it was at. I mean, I went to school because I was like, I get to eat whatever mom put in there, and then I get to go run around because that's what I want to do. So anyway, one of the things that we did at recess, we got really into soccer because that's what Steve said we were going to play. And Steve was like, I guess we're playing soccer because we got... We got banned from playing Red Rover because now you think about it, you're like, why does everybody keep breaking arms and messing up wrists? Because we're like linking arms and like smashing into people. And so anyway, uh, we're playing soccer at the time and all the boys are rallying and Steve brings the ball, he's throwing it out and we're out there playing and we would, I mean, dirty and it was fun and whatever. And then one day, I remember this, man, it was wild. One day, 
and had the audacity to walk up to us boys and ask if she could play soccer with us. Of which Steve picked up the ball and he looked at her like she was an alien who had just landed. And he was like, no, no girls allowed. And we were like, yeah. Remember, we're second graders here, so like we're stupid. And so we're like, the thought, the thought of this little, you know, pigtail, nice smelling, weird girl coming playing with us boys. Like this was boy time and this is all the things that boys did. You know, no girls allowed. That was like our mantra. Like we would, gosh, we were like a little street gang of like second graders. We'd walk over to like the jungle gyms and like, girls, move. And we would take over. And it was, now, before judgment comes, this is also the view of a lot of second grade boys because we're second grade boys. I didn't hang out with girls. I didn't play sports with girls. I didn't talk to them in my classes because we were second grade graders. But then we grow up and we realize, hey, Ann, what's going on? Like, <laughs> how you doing? But it was very much no girls allowed at that young age. And that's the way we wanted because that's the way, you know, it was just like, it was just going to be the boys. And, and, then, and then we grow up and understand that we grew up. However, there are some boys who now shave who never grew up. And some of them, not all of them, suddenly turned in misogynist and didn't even realize that they were misogynistic in their view of women. And their view of women was that they're, you know, lesser than, inferior to, not as important as, not as significant. And it's this perspective that objectifies and devalues women. And even some of these guys who grew up to hold these views would even be able to say, like, I can proof text it. They're like, I follow Jesus, and the Bible supports my view of the superiority of men over women. And you're like, what? And they go, yeah. Like, there's passages in the Bible, they said, that, that makes it incredibly clear that men are superior to women. And when you look at them, you look at, you know, passages like, 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Men, this is not the time this morning to say amen to any of the passages that I am reading. Okay? This is not the time. And you go, look, there it is, plain and simple. All scriptures, God breathed, inspired, right? Amen. All right, there it is, all right. No question about it. Ladies, quiet. First Corinthians. Well, women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. And these boys who grew up to shave would go, look, I follow Jesus. I believe the Bible. Look what the Bible says. Like, we're better than. They're supposed, they let them know their place. And if they take these and develop an entire worldview of women, they could take away from that and they could go, well, I mean, the Bible says that, that they shouldn't really speak up. They should just kind of be seen and not heard. I mean, that's what it says. I mean, from these passages, they could conclude that even a woman could never, whether in the church or even outside the church, be the boss of a man. They might even go, well, look, I don't even, woman, I don't even want a woman to, to teach me, because that's what it says, that they shouldn't. They should, be, they should be quiet. They should learn. They should be in their place. I mean, you could surmise from this, even as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I feel the tension in here, and it's just fantastic. <laughs> You can surmise by what Paul says in 1 Corinthians that, you know, hey, ladies, if you, if you want to learn, then it seems like you, you should have your husband's homeschool you uh, to instruct you better to understand. And another implication is that you're lesser than if you're not married as well, because only can you learn if you have a husband to teach you. And some of these guys can feel very justified in their misogynistic views of repressing and suppressing women because they're like, well, pfft, that's what the Bible says. But all along... We've also been understanding this, that what? 
We never read a Bible verse, amen? You can say amen to that. I know some of you are like, can I say it now? Can I say it now? Yes. We never read a Bible verse. Because when you just read a Bible verse out of context, we can make it say or support just about anything we want to. But rather, when we read something like this out of 1 Timothy or 1 Corinthians, our first question should be to ask what? Why? Why Why is that written? Who wrote it? Who are they writing it to? Because when we ask why, it leads to, here it is. So it's the most important, context. Then we understand the context in which it was written. We realize that it was written to a person, to a place, to a people at a time for a specific purpose. And like I said last week, and it's important for us to understand in our pursuit of biblical interpretation and understanding and handling correctly the Bible, is that we've got to go back in order to understand, right? We've got to go back to the culture, to the time, to the place to better understand why God inspired this to be written to these people in this place for this purpose. And when we understand that context, we can bring its meaning forward because then you have an incredible truth in which we can apply to our lives. But at first look, you can look at some of these passages and go, well, this is God's intent. This is God's intent of the dynamic between men and women. But in order to really understand God's intent in the creation between man and woman, we got to go all the way back to the beginning. And when I say back to the beginning, back to Genesis. And so if you've got a Bible, go ahead and feel free to join me. Back to Genesis. And in Genesis, we see God's intent in the creation of man and woman. Now, let me also say this. There is nothing in the created order that God created that is ultimately bad. It's we who have corrupted it, amen? It's all so good that after day six of everything he created, he goes, not only is it good, he said it is very good, a very emphatic agreement to what was created. We are the ones who have taken what God intended and what God created, and we have messed it up. So if we're looking at somebody to point the finger at, maybe we should all spend a little bit of time standing in front of the mirror and realize that ultimately we're the problem and God is not. So we've got to look at the original intent. What did God originally do when he was creating man and woman? And and, and what was he doing? And what does it mean? And so for that, we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. We've got to go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and then we're going to jump down to verse 18. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. At that point, then God set him in the garden, and he more or less said, Have at it. I've given you work as worship. I've given you everything. Name all these things that you don't know what they are. I'll give you dominion over them. But then came a time, as we see in verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Unfortunately, we look at interpreting certain words through the lens of a current culture, and we might have a tendency to translate a word like helper as like, oh, look at that. He made an assistant. He made an assistant because big man Adam had so many things to do, and he just needed somebody to take notes and make sure that he was well fed at the end of the day, right? No. Hear the sarcasm in that. It doesn't mean that he made a helper that was lesser than. It didn't mean he made a helper who wasn't as smart enough or as capable enough. What's interesting is you've got to delve into a word level, even that Hebrew word helper, more than 20 times it's used in the Old Testament. And the majority of the times it's used, it's in reference to God as our helper, one who helps us in our inadequacies, such as Psalm 54.4 says, God is my helper, the Lord is the sustainer of my life. So one who sustains, one who is greater than, and in this situation, God brought along a helper suitable for the man, an equal to a counterpart of. He took one part from to offer her for him. And when we look at woman as helper, we've got to understand this, that woman as a helper isn't about worth or value. Say amen to this. 
Guys, I'm talking to us for a second. Some of you grew up in cultures and situations or environments in which you saw modeled for you that women were devalued in regard to their worth or value. I pray that today, God the Holy Spirit elevates your understanding scripturally, biblically, theologically, that you are not greater than you are equal to, though different between men and women. And that's what God intended. And so it's not a matter of worth or value, but rather of relationship. Remember what he said, why he created woman. It's not good for man to be what? Alone, dudes, we get weird. And God, and God was like, this, mm, he needs a helper. Like, he needs an equal to. He needs a counterpart. That's what he created. It was this beautiful synergistic relationship between a man and a woman. And then guess what? The fall. The fall was humanity going, I know God's given us everything and run of all things and even of creation. He says, be fruitful and multiply, be plentiful, fill the earth and prosper. And he goes, you can have it all, everything. Nothing's off limit except one thing. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, hear this, God's intent of protecting us from that. Understand that we knew nothing of evil. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was God's protection that being all-knowing and sovereign, he didn't want us to experience something that he knew protecting us from it. But many times we see it from our perspective of what we don't have and what we feel that we're deserved. And so we said, let's cut out the middleman and we're gonna take matters into our own hands. How many times have we done that in our lives? I think I know what's best. I'm gonna go about it. I don't care what my biblical and theological and Christian values or perspectives are. I think I know what's best. And how many times do we look in the rear view of our lives and go, well, that didn't necessarily work out the way that I thought. Even the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, what? Leads to death, death. And so we have the fall, and in the matter of the fall of us taking matters into our own hands, the price of our disobedience was a disruption in God's intended relationship between men and women. And then there was a curse that came from this, a curse of disobedience that we see in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, something that we see that became kind of the foundation of a lot of the friction we see between the sexes, between men and women. And it says this in Genesis 3. This is God saying, on account of your disobedience, this is the repercussion of your actions. He goes, to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Now, people have asked for a long time, like, why was that part of the curse? Best explanation I've ever been able to get from the myriad of things that I've read over the years is one of the greatest gifts that women were given was to be co-participators with God in the bringing forth of life. And now because of the fractured nature of that between creator and creation, the same pain in which experience in the fall would be the same pain that women experience in childbearing. You're gonna have to take that up with God one day. <laughs> but then there was another part of it. And he said, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, many times we look at language like this, your desire, oh, does that mean that she like just gets all ready when he's coming home from work and puts out that fresh you know, apple pie and I just can't wait to tell him about my day and we can just hold hands and go for a walk? That's not the kind of desire we're talking about. What we're seeing here is a shift, not an equality, but in a shift. Instead of this, this, a power dynamic and a power struggle. A power struggle within the relationship that God intended to be complementary now is competitive. One wants to have dominion over the other one. And every honest married couple in the room and online said, yeah, I felt that a little bit. Somebody's always jockeying for position. Somebody always wants to be right. Somebody always wants to rule. And a part of the fall, the fracturing of that now is a fight about power, a power struggle and what we realized that there was a choice, there was a choice that caused all of this. And all of our choices have consequences and our choices still have consequences. We see this major one because of the fall. It broke the very dynamic of God's intended relationship between men and women. 
And many times we'll go wag the finger at other people in our lives, or maybe even we'll look at God and go, why did you allow this, when many times we have to look at the fact that we chose something different from what God says is best. We wanna hold on to bitterness and resentment, and we don't wanna move into the freedom of forgiveness because of somebody who wounded us in the past. But God goes, in our forgiveness, there's also a freeing, there's a letting go. It's not necessarily about them, it's a liberating of you. God goes, vengeance is mine, I'll take care of it. You have responsibility for your action. The grace that I lavished on you is a grace that you can give to them in the form of forgiveness. But we wanna hold on to bitterness and resentment. But there's a way that God says is best. Like he said to Adam and Eve, but yea, chose to do it their way. Many times as we listen to the voice of God through the word of God in our lives, we then look at it and go, mm, yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna go that way. I'm gonna do it my own way. And we have to ask ourselves, how's that working for us? to submit to God because he knows what's best or to think we know what's best and go about it our own way, only to look back in the rear view mirror of our own lives and go, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Yet, even though we messed it up, we gotta understand, we gotta take responsibility. We messed up God's perfect intended order. It did not diminish God using women in profound and amazing ways throughout Scripture. And you've got to realize that though, even though women's names um, are in ancient Near Eastern documentation, in and of itself is amazing because in so many ancient Near Eastern literature, it's primarily about the men and the great decisions and the things that they did, but God wanted to give credit where credit is due and say women are amazing because I created them and it is our choice to understand the equality and the beauty of what he designed. We see women such as in the Old Testament, Miriam and Deborah and Ruth and Esther, just a few. And then in the New Testament, we'll look at Lydia and Phoebe. Women are noted for the amazing things that they did. And the fact that God inspires the authors to write their names down. Like we have some in the Old Testament, such as Shifra and Pua in Exodus. They're the ones who Pharaoh said because they were the midwives of the Hebrew pregnant women. And Pharaoh said, they're tough, they're resilient women. Pharaoh, that's, you know, choose your words wisely. And he says, they give birth so fast. I need you to kill these children. And these two women said, no. Documented forever because of their civil disobedience, because they feared and revered God more than an evil Pharaoh. And because they said no, they gave the chance for Moses to be born. Moses to be born that God would use to liberate his people, to call out people that ultimately through them a Messiah would come in which we would all find liberation, life, purpose, and meaning and significance through the person and the work of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Because they said no. You have Rahab. You have Rahab, a prostitute. She gave shelter to the spies that were coming into the land that God had promised them. She said, I've heard the stories. I've heard the stories of your God. I know what he's about, and so therefore I fear him more than I fear my own situation and circumstances. I'll give you shelter. And then when Jericho fell, she was counted amongst the people of God, and not just because she did the right thing then. You look in the New Testament, and you realize that Rahab then became the lineage by which God brought forth the Messiah a prostitute, forever etched into the words of scripture forever because of doing the right thing. You look at Mary and Joanna and Susanna, and you're like, who are these ladies? These are the ladies who bankrolled Jesus' ministry and the disciples for three years. You can look at Luke 8, and you wonder, if you've never thought about it, how did Jesus and these 12 douches kind of wander around the countryside for three years? Ain't nobody working. They're preaching and teaching and healing and doing all these things. Somebody's got to bring in some income. Wealthy, accomplished women were bankrolling the ministry so that Jesus and his disciples could go about setting the foundation for the earth-changing, radical, transformational work that would become the death, burial, and resurrection of him. You also look at people like Priscilla. Priscilla mentioned in Acts 18, because of the grand orator, they called him the silver-tongued one, Apollos, 
as the church was developing, he knew how to spin a phrase and communicate, and he was very eloquent, but yet, through Paul, the Lord used Priscilla to help educate theologically Apollos. He needed a little further understanding of the incredible gift that he had been given, and the Lord so chose that Priscilla would be that person. And we bring these up because all throughout Scripture, it's not man who looks down on women. It is man who looks down on women. It's not God. God has elevated women in all throughout history in so many different ways that he's used them in such profound, redemptive capacities. And so that is the lens by which we have to see the context because we have to look at the overall context of how God has used women, what God says about women. Before we get into the New Testament, we look at certain passages like 1 Timothy or 1 Corinthians, and our tendency then would be to extract them out of context and weaponize them for our own agenda. And that's typically what we end up doing. We love to bend scripture to what we want it to say as opposed to submit ourselves to what it really says. And so now, in looking at these, we've got to ask ourselves, well, why were they written? Who are they written to? Why were these things said in the way that were said? And so we look at 1 Timothy. And so 1 Timothy 2, 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority. This is the most important thing right now. You'll see in the context, assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Well, who's writing to who? Who's Timothy? Why is he receiving this? Well, this is a letter from Paul to his protege, Timothy. Timothy is a pastor in Ephesus. It's important for us to understand this. So Paul is writing to this young pastor in Ephesus. Well, what's so significant about Ephesus? Ephesus at that time in the Greco-Roman world was also the center place of occult religion to the goddess Artemis. Artemis, even mentioned in Acts was so significant that it wasn't just the worship of, but it was the financial uh, byproduct of it that caused the city to be in an uproar because they were preaching the one true God. Well, there's some also things about the worship of Artemis. This was a female worship cult who was also looked over and presided over by castrated priests. But that's not all. In the evenings, it was known that the Temple prostitutes of Artemis would then descend into the city, calling and luring and inviting men to engage in worshipful acts back in the temple. And those worshipful acts were sex acts. They were the ones vocal, author, uh, exerting authority over men. Now, we see that as the backdrop, and we go, well, why? Why did he say what he said? Well, let's go back last week, and one of the first things that God says that he wants his freed people, Israel, to be, he goes, I want you to be different. I want you to be what? Holy. That doesn't mean you're better than. That means you're different than. He goes, I don't want your practices to be misunderstood as the cult practices of the place that you're at. I don't want the women of God to be misinterpreted, misunderstood as the women who are part of the cult of Artemis. Here's an example. Sometimes we need to exert a little cultural sensitivity regarding our sense of liberty. So if you happen to be jumping on a plane today and find yourself going to, I don't know, South Korea, okay? Anybody going to South Korea? Didn't think so. But if you're going to South Korea, there's things that we do here in the States that you might just easily do there. You're gonna go out to dinner, you're gonna have an incredible dinner. You're gonna have one of the greatest dinners that you've ever had in South Korea, and then at the end of it, you're going to tip. Don't do that. Well, if you're not going to South Korea, maybe you're going to the Middle East later this week. You know, a little business trip. And you love that your Uber driver and everybody has been so accommodating and so kind. The hospitality has been next level. And so you just give everybody a thumbs up. And as you're giving everybody a thumbs up, they are scowling at you. But I do that here. That's a custom here. You do something right, and I'm like, way to go. And you're like, way to go back. See, but if you're in South Korea and you tip your server, they consider that offensive because the wage in which a server makes is significantly more than somebody in the States makes. And so if a server receives a tip, they perceive that as being them doing lesser of a job than they could, that it wasn't an excellent performance on their part in serving. And so what you would think as something of kindness is perceived as an insult to them. 
You go to the Middle East and you love the hospitality and you're just giving everybody a thumbs up. That's the equivalent of you walking around and flipping everybody else off here. And so you're wondering why everybody's all mad at you and you're like, um, they're like, go away. In the context in which you're used to, it seems okay. But in the context in which you might go somewhere else, it's perceived offensive. And Paul's going, I don't want the people of God to be perceived as the pagan, pro, uh, the, the pagan uh, procedures and things that are happening in the city you're part of. I want you to be holy. I want you to be different. It's not that you don't have the liberty to. It's just the context that you're in. And that's important for us to understand as we look at 1 Corinthians as well. 1 Corinthians 14. He goes, women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. As the law says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. You go, wow, really? What's going on, Paul? Well, there's well, something you've got to understand about the Corinthian church. It was messed up. I mean, absolutely disorganized and disruptive, and there was some just wild stuff happening in the church that people knew about. One in particular, if you read chapters back, Paul goes, you think it's okay for this son to be sleeping with his father's wife? Uh-uh, no. And nobody's saying anything about it. It's like, what's up with you guys? And he's saying, some of you aren't eating before you come to church and you gather together and you're getting drunk during communion. How about we not do that? And so there's all this disorderly conduct that's happening in their corporate worship gatherings. And Paul's intent because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is to bring order. Well, saying that the women are to be, remain quiet is also an allusion to the fact that women are asking questions of their husbands to better understand what it looks like in their corporate gatherings to follow Jesus. In that time, the men were the ones educated. They had to rely on their husbands to better understand. And so it would be equivalent of sitting in here and somebody just deciding to have a very loud conversation in the middle of our gathering together, of which all of us, or at least most of us, would be like, shh, can you keep it down? Because it's what? It's disruptive. And Paul goes, I know you want to know. I know you want to learn. But there's a time and a place. It's not okay to be having a bunch of side conversations in the midst of our gathering. You want to know? That's great. Go learn in a different context. The same is true. Any of us that have had small kids, small kids and you had them in church, and something's said, and they're like, hey, what's going on? You're like, shh. Like, we'll talk about this later. We'll talk about it in the car. We'll talk about it over lunch. We'll talk about it not right now. Because it was disruptive, disorganized worship that Paul is addressing. And what you see is a bunch of hungry followers of Jesus who are women wanting to learn and understand. And the fact that that is mentioned, Paul goes, that's great. But let's not do it at the expense of everybody else and everything else that's going on. See, we've got to understand this when we look at the Bible, is the Bible is God's redemptive account of setting all things right through Jesus, including the relationship between men and women. We're the ones who messed it up. Let me speak to the guys for a second. You may have come from a place or a family or a tradition or a culture that looks down on women, I pray that this is an opportunity for you to see this is a chance to repent of that. And you're like, man, that's serious. Yes. To realize that the course of action in one direction is not biblical, is not God honoring. God wants you to see the women in your life not as lesser than but equal to and amazing in the way that God intended that relationship to be. And at the same time, can we all agree men and women are different and different doesn't mean unequal to. There's just some things, guys, women can do that we can't do. One, have babies. We can't do that, okay? And women, there's some things that guys have done. They can take off from the free throw line on a basketball court and dunk it. A woman has yet to be able to do that. There are some ways that men are stronger and faster. There's a lot of women that are way stronger and faster than a lot of us guys, but there are differences. The thing is God created us to be complementary. 
And when we no longer devalue another sex, we realize the complementary form in which God intended. And that is a powerful message of reconciliation. It's not just about differing views of gender. All of a sudden now we see the redemptive work that is intended throughout all of space and time through the perfect and completed work of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I pray that God would give us the eyes to see in which he originally intended for us to see the beauty and the dynamic of the relationships that he's brought together. And that despite what the world would say, we would pursue what God says and what is beautiful and have those restored that it might be a witness to the world. Lord, thank you. In the places where we have gotten our hands in it and we have seriously messed it up, which we do that time and time again. We take the beautiful thing in which you created and our selfishness, we recreate it in something that we want as opposed to what you want. I pray that there would be healing and restoration, reconciliation, beautiful dynamics and conversations that come out of this time as we look to your word and your intent about the dynamic and the relationship between men and women. May there be sensitivity and grace and humility. May you do a beautiful and redemptive work to the praise and the glory of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen.